Hi everyone and welcome to our NKCES online training series. This presentation focuses on specially designed instruction and behavior management strategies that we can use to support students with disabilities in small group instruction. This presentation was developed by Laura Clark and Jenny Millerhorn and presented at the Summer Behavior Institute 2019. So the learning targets for this presentation are for us to be able to identify those ready to learn skills and supports that students might need to become ready to learn, what skills students might need to build self-regulation and the specially designed instruction that we can use to support increased engagement on task behavior and understanding of expected school behaviors. So the first thing we need to think about when we're looking at what we need to be doing in small group instruction are things like, are there any barriers we already know about that will affect the learning? Do I have some data to support what I believe to be true, either about student learning, student achievement, or student um, social, emotional, and behavioral needs? Have I already developed some clear expectations for what I want to happen during that small group instruction? You know, is this small group instruction focused on academic content? Are we focusing on social, emotional, or behavioral expectations? And within our small, <coughs> excuse me, small group instruction, is there a school-wide PBIS system in place that has expectations that we can implement within our small group instruction. The first thing I always want to think about is in any group, whether it's small group, large group instruction, or working with a student one-on-one, -on -one, is, is every student in front of me ready to learn? And by that, I mean, are their social, emotional needs met? Um, do they have the pre-academic skills they need for the tasks that we are going to engage in? Is there anything else going on? Are they sick and we haven't identified that? Um, have they had enough to eat? Have they had enough motion and movement? Have they had enough to drink that they would be ready to sit and learn? And throughout any lesson that I'm teaching, I'm constantly assessing, are you still ready to learn? If not, what can I do? We know that if a student is not ready to learn, then no matter how fantastic my instruction is, how fantastic my tools are, that student isn't going to be able to receive that content as they would if they were ready to learn. So what can we do to get students ready to learn to be ready to engage with us? We know a lot about the brain thanks to recent brain research, and we know that the brain encodes information, consolidates information, retrieves information using some very specific pathways. But when a brain is under stress, that interrupts the pathways at multiple points in the learning process. So we know for sure that um, for students, whether it's new knowledge or knowledge that they already consolidated, that stress can impact a student's ability to encode and retrieve information. The links for the research that goes along with this brain research is included in the um, resource information that you got at the beginning of this training. So if you'd like to go deeper into this topic, be sure to check um, for those links. We know that one thing we can do to counteract stress on memory is to use an explicit instruction strategy known as retrieval practice. There are all kinds of excellent guides that synthesize the research around retrieval practice and give us very specific guidelines for how that should be implemented based on this evidence-based practice everywhere from supporting um, early childhood learning all the way up into AP classes. Retrieval practice is crucial to our students' success. So definitely within a small group instruction setting, I want to utilize those best practices of retrieval practice. If this is a new concept to you, you'll definitely want to dig in deeper to the retrieval practice research and again, this resource is linked in this presentation as well as in your resource guide. So to structure for success when I'm beginning small group instruction, I want to make sure that I've got a really solid lesson plan, whether I've got my students in small group for five minutes or for five hours. 
just a joke. Please don't have students instruction for five hours in a row. But definitely, no matter how long this small group is, I want to follow a clear and consistent format that might include something like this, where we start with some kind of a warm-up and goal setting so that students know exactly what we're looking to accomplish in this small group setting, what we call the meat and potatoes, or the actual content that we're trying to teach. We also want to make sure that we're ending with success, that students feel like they've accomplished a piece, part, or all of the goal that we've set, and that we've got some clear and consistent closing procedures so that students leave us having learned and are ready to learn for the next content area or class that they are going to. Some ideas around that structuring for success when we're looking at warm up and closing ideas. There are several great self talk <coughs> and mindfulness strategies that we can use, such as the concept of um, having kids use the touch points at the tips of their fingers and say um, affirmation phrases like, free to be me um, is a great way to support students. Also doing something we call whoosh breathing. Um, these concepts are linked into this presentation so that you can watch students engaging in those concepts. Another really great thing we can talk to kids about is helping them understand what happens when they are feeling stressed and they're doing what we call flip your lid or having some kind of an angry outburst. So teaching students what happens to their brain when they start to get in a heightened state and how they can help themselves come back into a state of being ready to learn by doing things like uh, mindfulness and uh, meditation. Um, some deep breathing will help students. There's lots of links um, throughout this presentation. So you have links to both the audio and the presentation itself. And feel free to link in and explore all of the resources that are hyperlinked. We know that mindfulness has a significant evidence base behind it that says it's great for supporting students. And we can find great resources on everything from Pinterest and Teachers Pay Teachers um, to many of the evidence-based websites that are out there. So here's an example of some free mindful breathing posters that you might use in an elementary setting. Definitely putting into practice things that students feel comfortable with that you've practiced over time and that students have some power over. And we talk a lot about the power of choice um, that really helps students to engage. So saying you know, at the beginning of our group, we're going to do a mindfulness activity. Which one would you like to choose today? And students might choose, you know, I'm going to do the breathe in, breathe out strategy. Or I like whoosh breathing. I'd like to do leaf breathing. Um, can really build student power and success. For those of you that are in a um, early childhood or elementary setting, definitely Go Noodle has some phenomenal resources. For those of us in secondary settings, thinking about doing some yoga and mindfulness meditation strategies can really help students feel empowered to center and calm before beginning an academic task. When we're thinking about getting students ready for that small group instruction, often we have students who benefit from sensory breaks or from um, being able to access a sensory room. So here's an example of a sensory room in one of our regional elementary schools where they have all kinds of phenomenal resources um, that were purchased at the school level um, to support students, whether they need um, some support in calming activities or activities in which they are recharging and getting ready to learn. So you see some of the different um, materials that are available through catalogs like Abilitations that have some phenomenal resources to support students, depending on what your students' specific needs are. Also, setting up things in your classroom, like safe places in the classroom where a student identifies Here's a place where I want to be able to go and sit, or I like to learn, you know, with my back up against the wall, sitting in a specific kind of chair, or you know, I'm more comfortable sitting on the floor to do an exercise or activity, but working with students to find those safe places in the classroom that they feel most ready to learn. And while we know that all of our classroom is set up to be a safe place for students, we definitely know students that have emotional and behavioral disabilities, students that have a background in trauma, 
often need to help define what they feel like is a safe place within our classroom structure. Another example of a place where a student identified this is my safe spot, you see um, down at the floor level, there's all kinds of cushing, cushions and padding that the student pulled together and this student likes to um, pop bubble wrap. So there's bubble wrap there um, and some other materials that the student likes hanging on the wall are pictures of the student's family that they identified as things that helping help them to calm and get ready before small group instruction. And so this student likes to set a timer, spend some time in that safe place and then come back uh, to sit at the table to do small group instruction. Many of our students uh, need support in developing those self-regulation skills, whether that's physical self-regulation, emotional, or cognitive self-regulation. There are lots of great resources, including selfregulationstation.com, that can help you develop lessons around those topics if you have students that need that level of support. <clears throat> and also some other fantastic resources such as this self-regulation meter where students can identify um, either by face or by color how they're feeling and what they might need to do to get back to that green or okay state. We have a significant evidence base that tell us what strategies are best for students who qualify with emotional behavioral disabilities. Many of these strategies are also effective for students who qualify under the other health impairment category for ADHD and students that qualify with autism. If you are looking to deepen your knowledge, there is a form that is linked in here that has the research all synthesized down and there's also reference to both of these journals, uh, Bond Behavior and Behavioral Disorders that have really detailed research articles around those strategies. But if you wanna check some quick tips this handout will really help you narrow down if you've identified areas where your students might need support or you're looking for a specific evidence-based practice that would increase a student's likelihood to engage appropriately in a small group setting. When we're looking at what's the best way to provide instruction, the evidence tells us that for students with disabilities, one of the highest evidence bases is around the concept of explicit instruction. So when we're looking at what types of specially designed instruction should we be providing for students, we always need to look at that explicit instruction concept. Anita Archer and Charles Huge have a fantastic resource, the Explicit Instruction Handbook. And <coughs> if you're interested in diving deeper into explicit instruction, feel free to check out some of our other fall offerings that have a further diving deep into explicit instruction. We know that there are lots of students who need support in developing appropriate social skills, and so they need specially designed instruction in social skills. So for small group instruction, often that's a really good time to use games such as Don't Go Bananas to engage students in conversation and some authentic social situations where they can role play and problem solve situations that stress them out. So if you search for social skills games or games like Don't Go Bananas, um, you'll find many resources that are fantastic for small group instruction specific to teaching those social skills that our students need. When we're looking at some cognitive activities that we can engage students in when we're in small groups, there are great concepts like using red dot, yellow dot, green dot to help students understand and think through their level of understanding of concepts. If you'd like to learn about the red dot, yellow dot, green dot strategy, um, click on the picture here and it is hyperlinked in to this resource. There's another fantastic academic strategy called Six Questions that's fantastic for small group instruction. If you've not used Six Questions before, link on into the video and check out Six Questions. We often want to help support our students' working memory, but are sometimes at a loss for how we can do that. <clears throat> so some quick suggestions of ways we can help students build their working memory are doing things like introducing a new word, a vocabulary word or a concept at the beginning of your small group instruction, 
and then challenge the students to see who can remember that word at the end and do that um, each day that you meet. You can do things like saying a set of numbers forwards and backwards or playing memory games. If you practice those skills five minutes a day, you will typically see improvement for our children. We know that working memory has slowly disintegrated for many students because they use technology and no longer need to keep lots of details in their working memory. But many students do have things they need to remember over time. If you're looking for some apps that you can use to support ways we can train working memory, um, there is a hyperlink here that will take you to a great resource. There is research behind the value of offering what is called practice turns and feedback, and small group instruction is an excellent time to do that. Our small group instruction should be really balanced so that there is not so much teaching time, but that there are opportunities throughout that lesson for students to engage in practice turns and feedback. And by practice turns and feedback, we're talking about a student practicing a skill getting feedback from us immediately after they have that practice turn and then being able to do that multiple times. We also know that students need retrieval practice and spaced retrieval practice over time, kind of thinking of that concept. If it was important to teach in September, that concept should be equally important in January and in May. So how are we going to offer students a systematic system for spaced retrieval practice over time. If you want to dive deeper into spaced practice, um, definitely check out Dr. Archer's explicit instruction resources hyperlinked on this slide. We also know that active engagement in learning can make a significant difference for our students. So if you haven't had a chance to check out Marsha Tate's book, Worksheets Don't Build Dendrites, I'd highly recommend you take a look at that. One great example of a way to get students actively engaged is to do something like body spelling, where every letter that goes below the middle line, like the G in the word growling, students would touch the ground. For letters that are in the middle, like the R, O, and W, the I, and the N, students would clap in the middle. And for the L, or any letter that goes above the line, and students stretch their arms like they're trying to touch the ceiling. Doing something active like body spelling often helps students to retain content better than just verbally doing something or writing it. For some of our students, they need a different way of learning. Um, students with autism and more significant cognitive or intellectual disabilities need things sometimes like work tasks. So if you're looking to build students' success, whether it's in early childhood all the way through to our grade 14 students, work tasks are a great way to go. The Autism Helper, um, under the guidance of Sasha Long, who is the, the Autism Helper's <coughs> creator, give us some excellent resources that we can use to create resources in our classroom. Uh, to purchase resources, I'd highly recommend the attainment materials, um, but for creating our own, the Autism Helper has fantastic ideas. Many of our students benefit from visual schedules, whether we're breaking down the parts of our small group instruction or the day. And um, This Reading Mama and Adapting for Autism websites both have excellent resources and those websites have been hyperlinked into your resource guide for this module. We know that setting up safe spaces in our classroom where students say, this feels like a safe space to learn, to explore, um, might be things like using alternative seating or having closer proximity to the teacher or a greater distance from the teacher to be able to sit and absorb. Having calm lighting can often make a difference as you see in this example, limited visual stimuli often support student engagement and learning and limited clutter around the classroom. For some of our students, when we're looking at building social skills, a great example of building academic content with social skills and embedding them together is doing something called emoji reading. You can do this during your repeated reading group, 
and throughout the text have students name emotions for how they're feeling or how they think a character is feeling. You can print out emojis um, from websites like the emojipedia.org website and have students point to different emotions that either they are feeling or the character is feeling and then talk about what made them think that emotion was being displayed in the text. <coughs> when we're thinking about sensory breaks, um, it's really important that we keep in mind that sensory diets should never be ignored. So even if we're running late, if we're almost out of time, we should never think about sensory diets as being something we could skip. Um, a sensory diet is not a reward. And if you explain it as a dosage of medicine, remember that medicine should always be taken at the same time, the same dose each day, or time for it to work. And it's the same thing with sensory diets. So it's not a benefit or a, re a reward, but a required element that a student needs to be successful. So we want to make sure that we honor that just like we would honor a student getting medicine on time. For our students that really benefit from visual supports, using something like a first then or a first then next schedule can be very helpful for our students. Adding token economies to increase student engagement can be super important. Both of these systems are beneficial only if we can appropriately or properly identify what motivates the student. If we've chosen something for them and they are not interested in working for computer time, then they're not likely to engage in that task. But if the motivator is high, um, then we know that we're more likely to get students to engage in that task. If you're looking at what is out there in the world of motivators, um, using resources like this one from adventuresofaschoolmom.com um, and think about resources, whether they are free in our classroom or um, resources that involve people time as opposed to cost, we often can come up with multiple reinforcers that work for students. So as we wrap up our conversation today, I'd love for you to ask yourself the question, what can I do to support my students' success in small group instruction? What can I do to ensure that every student is ready to learn and stays ready to learn from the beginning of our lesson until the very end? Hopefully some of these strategies will help. And if you've got great ideas that you would like to share out, please email them to me. I would love to hear. If you are watching this video as part of a training series, please be sure to go back and complete the quiz or evaluation so that you can earn your PD certificate. And if you've got questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me and check the nkces.org website. We've got tons of other great trainings this season. We'd love to see you or have you participate virtually. Happy learning.